Back in the 1950s, there was a comedian by the name of Flip Wilson. And he revolutionized, I guess, like late night TV. And, and I'm sure most of y'all have never heard of him. But, but he had this little skit. It was like, the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. He was always doing bad stuff. And that was a skit. The devil made me do it. You know, that joke launched his career. But the reality was that joke became a national excuse for sin behavior. I ran out of gas. The devil made me do it. No, the devil didn't make you do it. You just forgot or you were irresponsible. Or your husband didn't do what he said he was going to do. What I want to tell you is, is that all this, which started as a joke with him, but has always been an eternal alibi that Satan's offered to us, is that a lot of it is grounded in unbelief. It comes in unbelief. And this is what we're going to talk about in chapter 6, is unbelief. You see, Satan tells the world, I exist. He's not hiding no more. He's not hiding anymore. He is wide open. Abortion's okay. This is okay. All these other confusing issues of the cultural milieu is okay. The devil's telling you, I'm here. 83% of professed Christians do not believe the devil is real. Unbelief. God himself says, I'm real. I'm here. I exist. I'm alive. Less and less. Christians believe that God's real. Unbelief. Unbelief. And I want to tell you, unbelief is not from the devil. You make that choice whether to believe or not. Which one are you going to choose? I'll tell you that the one thing that the Lord put on my heart for this week, it's that unbelief creates confusion and missed opportunities to encounter with Christ. Equipping and discipleship, it brings clarity and it amplifies the gospel message. You see, belief in God is a choice. Choose wisely. Your eternal destination depends upon it. So if we can stand on the word that will anchor our eternal destination with God Almighty, and we're going to read as we, we continue, we actually move into chapter 6. And so we'll read together as the body and we'll begin. Jesus left that part of the country and returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. The next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. They asked, where did he get all this wisdom and power to perform such miracles? Then they scoffed. He's just a carpenter, the son of Mary and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and his sisters live right here amongst us. They were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Then Jesus told them, A prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and amongst his relatives and his own family. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Yeah. Then Jesus went from village to village teaching the people, and he called his 12 disciples together and began sending them out two by two, giving them authority to cast out evil spirits. He told them to take nothing for the journey except a walking stick, no food, no traveler's bag, no money. He allowed them to wear sandals but not take a change of clothes. Wherever you go, he said, stay in the same house until you leave. But if any place refuses to welcome you or listen to you, shake its dust from the, your feet as you leave to show that you have abandoned those people to their fate. So the disciples went out telling everyone they met to repent of their sins and turn to God. And they cast out many demons and healed sick people, anointing them with olive oil. This is what we've been building up to. Jesus is the teacher. D Jesus is preparing the disciples to go out. But like any good teacher, you don't just say, go do. Go do what? I don't know, just go do. Like Jesus has been walking these disciples through a, through a master class in discipleship. But you see, you won't believe what unbelief can do. Like in 19, I'm sorry, in 2022 in a Gallup poll, 81 people said they believed in God. So you say, well, 81% of people believed in God. That's not bad. That is actually the lowest amount of 
polled Christians since 2011. Since 1944 to 2011, more than 90% of Americans believed in God. Unbelief has become what's separating and dividing people from Christ. Unbelief is not an issue of the devil. Unbelief is your decision, your choice. You choose what you believe. You see, Jesus was rejected at Nazareth. And Jesus is being rejected today. Why? Unbelief. You see, believing in God and believing God are very different. You can say, well, I mean, I believe the cowboys because they exist. Do you believe in the cowboys? I don't know. Look at their track record. But I can tell you the Lord's undefeated. If you're going to believe in something, I'd suggest you believe in God Almighty. So what led his hometown to not believe it, that he was the Messiah? Well, first thing I would suggest is familiarity. Sometimes we get a little too familiar with, with maybe a sp our spouse. Maybe we neglect to, that initial pursuit that led us to woo them and bring them to a state of marriage. Sometimes we get a little too familiar with the Lord. And we lose reverence. And then we lose belief. Well, if he was really a good God, he wouldn't do this or he would do that. You see, familiarity, because he was from that hometown. With the people, they saw him for the life he lived and not the calling he fulfilled. How many of us hesitate to share the gospel with our family? Because, well, I know who you are. I remember what you did. Nobody's going to believe you. Do you know what you used to do? They don't see the calling that Jesus is fulfilling. They're unaware that the prophecies pointed to Jesus. They've got the, the Old Testament. They just refuse to see it. What they did, they expected a powerful earthly conqueror. They simply wanted out from the crushing oppression of Rome. They weren't thinking eternity. They were thinking, what's good for me now? What stops you from seeing, believing, and encountering Jesus on your own? I want you to look for areas of unbelief in your life. I get texts throughout the week from folks. They're like, I just, I just don't know. I don't even know if he's real. Well, why not? Well, I asked for this, and I hadn't got that. I get it. You're placing your own expectations on an eternal God. You're putting him in a box. You want him to be your genie that you rub, and he, and, he, and he creates miracles on demand. That's not God. You see, in the cultural context, the Jews had a preconceived expectation of the Messiah. They thought he was supposed to be one way. I would suggest that a lot of times that's how we look at him. How many times do we hear? Well, a loving God would never send people to hell. God doesn't send anybody to hell. God gives you the freedom to escape through his son, Jesus Christ. You see, his rejection by his own people, it highlights the gap between expectation and what God provided. God gave them his only begotten son. The greatest gift he could give, he gave to his people. But because they had an unrealistic expectation, they were, they were actually underwhelmed at the presence of the Messiah. He wasn't what they thought he should be. So they rejected him. So I want to tell you about unbelief. Unbelief ignores the obvious. Mark 6, 1 tells us, And he went out from there, and he came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come... Uh, he began to teach in the synagogues, and many hearing him were astonished. You see, his disciples were moving from sometime belief, unbelief, but more into belief because they were following him. They were, they were becoming a mirror image of the Christ. They were being discipled by him. They were following her. They didn't just catch a little Jesus on Sunday and, and maybe a little Jesus on Wednesday and, and maybe a funny Facebook meme on Thursday night. They were following Jesus, to follow him doesn't just mean go in the same direction. It means go as he goes and go as he goes. If he starts his walk with his left foot, 
you start your march with the left foot. They're imitating him to become a mirror image. And it said that the people were astonished. In the Greek, that means to strike out of one's wits, to blow your mind. Can you imagine Jesus teaching? Like Jesus teaching, the teacher. The people were, their minds were blown. They were astonished at his teaching. But you see, when you mix that with unbelief, it don't matter. There's nothing he could have said that would have changed their mind. There's nothing he could have done that would have changed their mind. They were stuck in their own hard-heartedness of unbelief. You see, when they said, saying, did this man get, where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? You see, in the Greek, the phrase, where did this man get these things? The word is hutos, and it is a word of contempt. When they say this man, it's like this fella. Like, where did this dude find this stuff out? Like, who is this guy? His own people are showing contempt for him and the words that they're using. They're not amazed and astonished with the supernatural presence and the spiritual presence of the Messiah. They're just disrespecting him like, who's this guy? When, they, when the, the word that they use for wisdom in the Greek is Sophia, and it means general knowledge, practical wisdom. They're not giving any attribution to the spiritual or the supernatural nature of Jesus Christ. They're like, he's entertaining but where did he get all this information? He doesn't even have Google. Because they're locked in the unbelief. Well, that's just, that's just a carpenter. You see, unbelief, it focuses on the irrelevant. My goodness, how many times have we seen signs and miracles and healings and deliverance? And we say, yeah, but. Yeah, but. You see, yeah, but we had to stay 30 minutes after service. They focus on the irrelevant. Mark 6, 3 tells us, Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? When they use the word brother, it, remember, it's the Greek, it's the word adolphos. And, and part of what adolphos means is that it, they're they're equating Jesus to his brothers, which means equal rank and dignity. His brothers are just dudes. He's just a dude. There's nothing special about him because he's just a carpenter. They felt Jesus was no better than his siblings. They keep minimizing his stature as the Christ. They keep making references to him being nothing special. The supernatural is missed because of the unbelief. They even call him the son of Mary. This is the only time, <clears throat> this is the only time in the Gospels that, he's, that this title is used to describe Jesus. The son of Mary. Because of the culture, it was always the masculine. Joseph's son. Now, maybe at this time, Joseph had already passed away. Maybe that's why they didn't reference to him specifically for Joseph. But the fact, again, that they referenced him as the son of Mary was a sign of, of diminishing, of disrespect. You see, people in unbelief are going to focus on anything that they want to believe to support their case to make it irrelevant. If somebody's been healed, they're going to say, yeah, but you had to go to the doctor first. If somebody's going to be, if somebody's going to be saved, well, are they really saved? Or are they just wanting to get out of trouble? Like, like don't diminish the supernatural in unbelief. Don't explain away the miraculous nature of the unexplainable. We're looking so much for the spectacular that we miss the supernatural. Unbelief is easily offended. Mark 6, 3. So they were offended at him. It's like, seriously? Like, like just change the channel. Just go back to your house. I mean, he comes back across Galilee into Capernaum, and there's hordes of people waiting by the water for Jesus. They were astonished. They were amazed. They marveled at the things he did. And then he goes back to his hometown, 
and their unbelief. And they're offended. They're easily offended. The Greek word is scandalizo. That's where our English word scandal comes from. And it means to cause to stumble morally. It's also referred to what's called a bait trap. Survival, uh, survival skills. You know, you basically have a stone, you have a stick, you have a little rope, and an animal comes through or you're, whatever you're hunting. And, and then it, it knocks out the stick. Bam! Kills them. Now you've got supper. This is what they're, they're claiming Jesus is setting a trap. He's scandalous in what he's telling us. You see, people are going to divert their attention from the truth to justify the rejection of Jesus. I can tell you, you got to believe Jesus to reject Jesus. And we do it in the church. We do it in the body of Christ. Well, he didn't do this. He didn't do that. What I would suggest is that we, is that we don't let the unbelief hinder the supernatural. Like, let Jesus be Jesus on Jesus' timeline. And Mark 6, 5 tells us, Now he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Remember, the, the Greek phrase for the word laid hands on, it means to impose a name, to impose with authority. I share all the time, be careful who you let lay hands on you. I don't mean a pat on the back, but if someone's going to lay their hands and they're going to pray, that there is a transference of power in the laying on of hands. That could be, uh, that could be demonic power as well. There is an imposition of, of will. You go back through the Old Testament. Never did they say, I'm going to give my blessings to Edgar. No, there was a laying on of hands for the transference of the legacy of the blessing. You know, Luke 4.40 says, When the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. This was Jesus healing people. All these people that came to him, he laid his hands on everybody. There was a transference of power. And it still holds true today. You know, it said healed. Again, we, we talked about this. The word when he says healed in the Greek is therapo. And that's where our English word therapy comes from. It means to cure, to heal. Healing is a process. Excuse me. Healing is a process. It's therapy. Jesus is laying hands on in the process of therapo, of healing. Remember, God wants you healed, but he wants you to participate in the process. We move down to Mark 6, 5, and it says, Now he could, he could do no mighty works there. Now Mark uses the term could do no, but Matthew used the term Jesus did not do. Mark's not saying that Jesus was incapable or restrained from doing miracles. It said he could not. So an example would be if I say, well, the quarterback could not cross the line of scrimmage and throw the ball. Physically, the quarterback can cross the line of scrimmage, but to have a, a legal uh, pass, he could not cross the line of scrimmage. So don't, under, don't mistake <clears throat> and think that in any way Jesus' power was constrained. When it said he could not do, understand that from that point of view. He could not do, Matthew says, did not do. So why didn't he do? Well, he physically could. But you see, if the people had already rejected Jesus... They were going to reject the miracle. Actually, it was going to make them become even more hard-hearted because they were in a state of rejection. Which would, but actually, it was actually a sign of mercy by Jesus not doing these miracles by forcing himself upon the will of others that had already rejected him. It would have made it harder for them to come to Christ after that. So I want to share with you an equipping note. You see, you're going to encounter people that don't believe no matter what you say or what they see. This is all Jesus, the teacher, teaching you to do what Jesus does. I want you to know that in this same way that Jesus was rejected because of unbelief, you're going to share the gospel, and people are going to reject, not you. They're going to reject the gospel. Don't let that turn into cold water. I guarantee everybody in here, the first time you, you worked up the nerve to share Jesus, or even say out loud, like, well, the Lord was telling me, uh, while I was praying, the first time you got a little negative resistance, you shut it down. They're not rejecting you. 
You know, if I poured this water out and and shared it with my wife, and Leah's like, that water's nasty. It's a rejection of the water, not of the bottle. You be the vessel that pours the message of the gospel. It's not a rejection of you. All you got to do is simply share the gospel message as directed by the Holy Spirit. You know, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, 8, that some will plant, some will water, but only God brings the increase. You see, their belief in Christ is not your responsibility. You simply plant the seed. I don't want this to throw you when you're out there when the Lord sent you. And this is where we come into Mark 6, 7. It says, sending out the twelve. You see, these disciples, they've been taught. Jesus has brought them with them. They, they just came back from the region of the Gadarenes where he cast out legion. I mean, not to say, oh, look, there's a lot of demons. What it is to say, you see, there's a lot of demons, but they ain't nothing compared to the power that in the Holy Spirit. I want you disciples to see this because you're going to go do this. And now it's time. Now it's time. All the learning lab, all the lessons, all the teaching, they're being sent out on their first field trip. A limited assignment so they could do what the Lord has taught them to do. Mark 6, 7 tells us, And he called the twelve to himself and began to send them out two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits. So first off, why two by two? Is it just so they can tell jokes along the way and and be happy? What Jesus is actually doing is he's honoring Deuteronomy 17, 6, which says you're going to affirm the truth by, by two witnesses, by the bearing of two witnesses. You see, a lot of times people, they're like, oh, the Old Testament don't matter. That's the Old Covenant. That's, let me tell you, from beginning to end, everything matters. Do not discount the truth of the Old Testament. So this is Jesus. And it's simple and it's practical. But he's honoring Deuteronomy. You're going to affirm the truth? Two witnesses. So the word to send in the Greek is to send forth a messenger, to put forth into action. Jesus was teaching his disciples, but once he sent them, they became apostolic. That's the Greek word for to send. It's apostello. The Greek word for sin is apostello, which is where apostolic comes from. These disciples became apostolic. When you sit in, in an equipping church and we encourage five stones all the time, like we're not just meant to just come here and, and this be enough. Go out. You are being sent. You are being covered. You are being prayed for. You are being trained to be sent out. You become apostello. You become apostolic. You become apostles for carrying out the message of Christ. It's the same thing that Jesus did. He didn't do it just so we could be like, oh, that's a great book. It's going to look great for Christmas when I crack it open and all the fancy red lettering. And then we're going to pick it. This isn't what this was written for. This is a field guide to live by, to do by, to share by. It's just a training manual. We, we've made it, not we, but so, so they just get weirded out and it becomes mystical and sometimes decorative for the holidays. This is a training manual. It's a field guide. Not F-E-E-L. A field guide to go out and do the work of the ministry. Now, when Jesus commissioned these brothers and he gave them power, he gave them the power of the Holy Spirit. But understand, they were not indwelled with the Holy Spirit. That would come on the day of Pentecost. He gave them limited authority for a limited assignment for a limited amount of time. It's similar to in the the Old West when when you would assemble a posse. You gave them commission, legal authority, to go out on a certain assignment. And this is what Jesus was doing. He was equipping them with the power to go out on this assignment. To heal and cast out and to preach. Mark 6, 7 tells us, He gave them power over unclean spirits. Do y'all remember the word akathartos? We talked about this. It means unclean. It's the Greek word for lewd, for foul, for unclean. When did he use that word the last time? When he was in the region of the Gadarenes. When he was confronting a legion. You unclean spirit. So Jesus, the great teacher, what Jesus is doing is Jesus is using the same terminologies. He wants his disciples to understand those foul spirits that we dealt with in the region of the Gadarenes 
are the same foul spirits that you're going to be dealing with when you go out two by two. Jesus wasn't pulling any punches or, or trying to trick anybody. He's the teacher. He communicates clearly, using clear language, clear terms, knowing who they're going to be dealing with. You're going to be dealing with akathartos, unclean, foul spirits. And in case one of the disciples had forgotten, he goes, do y'all remember Agathartos and the Gadarenes? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Same thing. Same thing. I don't care where we're at. I don't care how many there are. It's the same unclean spirit that you're dealing with. Mark 6, 8 tells, He commanded them to take nothing for the journey except the staff, no bag, no bread, no copper in their money belt, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. You see, back then, well, I say back then, even today, but particularly back then, like traveling was dangerous. It was very dangerous. And you were absolutely dependent upon the hospitality of strangers. So what the Lord was telling them was those folks who received the apostles, then they became obligated to provide food and shelter and sustenance. You know, there's so many families in this church that open their home to other family members, to strangers, people in need. Such a beautiful gift of hospitality and hosting. But what Jesus is telling them, he's sending them out. This isn't their lifelong assignment at this point. This is a field trip. This is a field trip. And he's saying, pack light. Pack light, it's a short assignment. And then Mark 6.10, he goes on and he says, And he said to them, In whatever place you enter a house, stay there until you depart from that place. And whoever will not receive you nor hear you, when you depart from there, shake off the dust from under your feet as a testimony against them. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment in that city. So when Jesus is telling these brothers, do not take anything for the trip. Don't even take a second tunic. Don't bring a change of clothes. Just wear what you got. What he's doing, he wants them to learn to depend only on God. Don't take no money. Leave your credit card at home, Leah. Matter of fact, give it to me. (laughs) Don't take no credit card. Don't take no cash. Don't take nothing. I want you to depend only on the provisions of God. What he's also doing is he's wanting them to learn to determine who was and who was not receptive to hearing the good news. Because I'm going to tell you, not everybody's receptive. Some people are so stuck in unbelief that no matter what you say, what they see, it's not going to change their hearts. Their hearts will not be circumcised from the hardness of unbelief that they built up. So what... What he wants them to learn and he wants us to learn is share the gospel, but don't get so locked into pride that I'm going to make them believe. I'm going to bring them to the kingdom if I got to bring them uh, kicking and screaming. He wants them to understand who receives, who rejects. And if you reject, hit the road, shake off the dust and hit the road. What we do is we'll sit in a grave and we'll try to talk somebody up out of the dirt when they've got no intention of getting out of the hole. There's too many other people that are waiting to hear that word. But you know what? Share the word when you're in the grave and get up and go. Somebody else is going to be sent along to water that thing. He wants them to experience the reality of, this, of peace and rejection and peace and reception. You cannot live your, your ministering life highs and lows. High. Now look, it's good. It's good when somebody receives Christ. It's good when you, can, when you walk somebody into, into that salvation posture. But you can't be super high and then super low when they reject. He's wanting them to realize there's peace in the rejection and there's peace in the reception. All you got to do is share the word. You can't live and die like a quarterback like a court, or a pitcher. I guess we're in a World Series. Is you can't live and die by the ball in the strike. You've got to forget the last ball or the last home run hit off your. You've got to get ready for the next pitch. But that's what we do. You see, we'll find ourselves living and dying by the rejections. And then elated in the reception. There's too much work to be done. You see, Jesus is wanting to show them. He wants to show them that there's real life consequences for rejecting God's Son, Jesus Christ. If they don't receive you, shake the dust off your feet. That was a sign of judgment in those days. Shake the dust off your feet and hit the road. 
there's consequences for rejecting God's son. You see, this world, this world wants a passive God. He wants a, this world wants a passive daddy. And he's going to say, you know what? I know I sent my son Jesus to die on that tree. I know I gave the most important, valuable thing I've got to give to you. And I know you rejected him. But it's okay. It's okay. I'm going to let you all in anyway. You see, that's what the world's hoping for. Let me tell you, it ain't going to happen. It is not going to happen. There are consequences for unbelief and for rejection. You know, Matthew 10, Matthew 10 tells us, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father and daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Jesus didn't come to make everybody happy. Jesus came with the sword. Jesus came with the word. Jesus, Jesus came with the truth. And that divides down to bone and marrow. It divides people. Let me tell you something. It divides churches. Churches. If you haven't seen what's going on with, with Israel and Hamas and the, amongst the Christian community, the simple truth of truth is dividing Christian churches. Good. Good. It needs to be divided. The wheat and the chaff are going to be divided. The sheep and the goat are going to be divided. We've got to know that there's consequences for unbelief and rejecting God's Son, Jesus Christ. Mark 6.12 tells us, So they went out and preached that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. You see that first part? That they should preach what? Repentance. Repentance. Nobody wants to talk about repentance. You know, churches don't want to talk about it because, well, repenting, repent of what? Repent of sin. So if you're saying I've got to repent of sin, you're saying that I'm, I've got sin? Well, I'm going to go to another church that doesn't think I have sin. I'm going to go to another church that doesn't think I've got to repent. But yet here Jesus sends the disciples out and says, preach that people should repent. Like that's the first thing. That's the first thing, is repenting of sin. Moving from righteousness to righteousness, from glory to glory. Uh, Romans 12, 1, living your life as a holy living sacrifice. And the, deep, the, uh, the disciples were, they were sent out to preach repentance. You see, they've been watching Jesus amaze the crowds with power and authority in his teaching. But now it's their turn. And this is where, where this is the power of an equipping church. For about two years, we've been committed, we've been training, we've been working. And it's coming to the point where it's time to go out. It's time to take everything that we've learned, everything that we've applied. It's time to go out. You know, I spent 22 weeks in a police academy. And then I spent months in a special operations academy. But it wasn't until I went out in the field on assignment that I was actually doing police work. It wasn't until I left the Special Operations Training Academy that I was doing the work of special operations. We're learning. We're in an equipping church. When, when we move, when this, when this church moves into a new season, not just a new physical building, this is a new season. It is a season for impact. We're still going to train, but it's a time to make impact in our community. This is what Jesus is doing. This is the beauty of God. <laughs> we started Mark before we had a clue. We had a location. And when the location came available, the Lord began to reveal, this is why you're in the book of Mark. This is the field guide for the transition into the season from equipping to impacting. This is what we're being called to do. And, and so you could sit, you could sit and be like, oh, that guy's good on Sunday. I don't like the Cajun accent, and it's weird that his left eye is swelling a little bit, but, but, but I dig it, and I'll come back on Sunday. Amen. Thank God. I love to see you. But what are we doing from the time we leave until the time we come back? This is what Jesus is telling the disciples, and it's not for those 12 brothers. It's for all of us, all of us. 
It's time to get out. It's time to make impact. It's time to be impacted. But we don't go nowhere if we're carrying rocks of unbelief. Jesus was equipping them simply to do the Father's will. What is the Father's will? To preach, to heal, deliver. Mark 1, uh, 38, 39. We'll go back to the Amplified. He replied, let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may preach there also. That is why I came from the Father. So he went throughout Galilee, preaching the gospel in their synagogues and casting out demons. Jesus is preparing them. Jesus is preparing you for long-term ministry, lifelong ministry. You see, we'll see later in Luke, Luke 22. Jesus tells them, and then Jesus asked them, when I sent you out to preach the good news, he's talking about today's lesson, Mark 6. This is Luke 22. He says, when I sent you out to preach the good news, you did not have a money bag, a traveler's bag, or an extra pair of sandals. Did you need anything? Well, the answer is no. It was a short-term limited assignment. It was a field trip. This is different. And Jesus says, no, they replied. But now, he said, take your money and a traveler's bag, and if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. You see, times change. This, this was a limited assignment. This was a field trip. Practical application, two by two go out. Eventually, they're going to be sent out on their lifelong mission. Eventually, they're going to have to have provisions. They're going to have to have things to sustain their ministry. You see, what happened is when Jesus, when Jesus, as amazing as his teaching was, when he sent the 12 out, he amplified the gospel message by 12. So we could sit here on Sunday and be, oh, that's cool. We usually get out in time to go to Veracruz, and I'm digging it. But when you take the message and you share it with your family, with your friends, with your work, on your social, social media. You're multiplying the message of the gospel. You're amplifying the gospel message. Jesus is preaching. He's amazing people. Jesus is preaching. He's being rejected by people. Boom. But it's still Jesus sharing the message. Boom. Amplification, multiplication by 12. By just sending out those 12. And they began to, people began to take notice. They began to make a stir. This is why you got to continue the Great Commission. This is why we can't just be satisfied and satiated by coming in on a Sunday and just sitting and listening, and then we're not sharing the Word of the Lord. We cannot not share the Word of the Lord because we're afraid of what somebody might say. We can't only share the Word of the Lord because we like the endorphins, the adrenaline that it makes us feel when somebody comes to Christ. Because as high as that high is, the low as the low is going to be when they reject, not you, but the Word of the Lord. And you know what you do? Bam! Knock the dust off your feet and keep moving. The Lord will send somebody else with that soul. Or if he directs you to go back, you go back. But this is what Jesus is teaching people. Because you know why? His time was limited. Let me tell you all something. Your time's limited. Our time's limited. If you don't believe that we're in the last days, we're in the last days. Every second we live, we're one second closer to that last day. And that last day is a glorious time if you're a believer in the Lord. If you don't, it's time to get right. What I want to tell you is that you've got to be a, a light to a dark and dying world. You know, back in my special operations days, we had, a, we had a, a, a motto, a slogan, whatever they call it. And it was, if not us, who? Because the truth was, local law enforcement had failed. We got sent, or any law enforcement. When our unit was sent in, there was nobody else coming to save us. The military couldn't come in because of passe comitatus. They can't use, they're not supposed to use weapons against their own citizens on domestic soil. Like it was just us. And if you don't think there was a sense of severity realizing that it was just us, if not us, who? I'm going to ask you because this has eternal consequences. It's not whether or not an arrest was made or whether or not this and that. I'm asking you for eternal consequences. If not you, who? If you don't share the gospel with somebody, who will?